Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as you can see from the title, I want to show you that the law is not an ass. <laughs> Hopefully, I will succeed this evening in doing so. And mind you, I'm also trying to convince myself of it, I might add. I'm going to give you a very, very simplistic overview of the law and its purpose and how the law tries to achieve its objective, namely fairness, and that is what I write about. So I'm going to give you an overview of what I write about. We're going to hopefully discover that the law is not an ass, but it is some lawyers and judges who are asses. <laughs> The purpose of the law, if you Google it, it will give you a whole lot of things to punish people for their crimes. I mean, some of us want to punish Pistorius and all these things. But really, it is to maintain some kind of order in society and to maintain a society where we've got noble things such as fairness and justice, which none of us know what they mean anyway, but this is what we strive for. We have some idea of what it means, but there are terms that are incapable of precise definition. So that's what I work with, terms that are incapable of precise definition. The purpose of the law, if I want to sum it up quickly for you, is to do what Matthew tells us and other pieces of the Bible, and I'm not familiar with um, as I am with the Labor Relations Act. But I know that in many pieces of the Bible, it says that do unto others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. So if you do unto others what you want them to do to you, you will realize that there's obligations created. And legal, legal obligations are created so that we can maintain social order. And I think most of us in here, if we are sane, which again is a term which is incapable of precise definition, would want a society that has fairness and justice. Do you agree? So I'm going to make a deduction. It's not a mathematical one, but the fact that you agree would indicate to me that you, number one, have moral values, and number two, you are probably sane. Okay. I just want to give you a very quick overview of how obligations arise in the law, and in order to do so, I have to give you a background, those of you who haven't had anything to do with the law ever. Basically, there's two branches, civil law, and criminal law. Civil law can be divided into the law of delict and the law of contract. And both the law of delict and the law of contract give rise to obligations. So if we have a contract, we've got an agreement between two parties and the parties agree to do certain things and the contract gives rise to rights or duties and obligations sorry, rights or duties and obligations, on the other hand, to both parties. So I agree that I'm going to purchase Crystal's car for 20,000 Rand. My obligation is to pay her 20,000 Rand and her obligation is to deliver the car to me and transfer ownership to me of the car. So both Crystal and I have duties and we've got rights. And they, those arise ex contractu, out of the contract, but there are obligations. Delict, the duties arise ex lege, from the law. So all of us have duty to, for example, drive our car carefully, diligently, watch where we're going. Um, if, I don't want to pick out any of you, but I will. See, Henny is somewhere else. So let's say Henny is driving along and there's a billboard of a half-naked, beautiful young woman. And um, so he's busy watching the billboard and he doesn't realize he's driving at 120 kilometers an hour and he smashes into another car. And of course he causes damage to the car and, and damage to the person who's in the car. And... Um, Oh, he can't say, I don't have an obligation to, 
to pay you for those damages because we don't have a contract. There's no contract between us that says that I have to drive carefully when you're on the road next to me. So clearly, we can't sue Mr. Fisser on the basis of contract, but we can on the basis of delict, the rises ex lego. We have a legal duty to not behave in a negligent manner. And if our friend Mr. Pistorius is, is found to have behaved negligently, then he will be found guilty of culpable homicide. If he's found to have behaved intentionally, then he will be guilty of murder. Which brings me to the next branch of law, which is criminal law, and there the fault is in the form of intention. Okay, so we've got these obligations, and the law creates obligations, and the law creates obligations because if we don't have obligations towards others, and we can do whatever we like, we're not going to have a very ordered society, and we're not going to have fairness and justice. Why are you so? Some people of of frowning like my puppy, like what's, what are you getting at? But hopefully by the time I finish, you, you'll, you'll get to what I'm getting at. I'm going to tell you about the reasonable man because when, I know you're laughing because you're thinking, especially the woman, there's no such thing as a reasonable man. But, <laughs> But by the end of today, you, hopefully at least one of you will agree with me that there is such a thing as a reasonable man. The reasonable man is the, I agree, Isaias, you are a reasonable man. I would agree, in my view. And just like there is a reasonable man, there is a reasonable woman, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> but the reasonable man is very important in law. Have any of you been watching the Oscar Pistorius thing? Can you see what they're getting at? How, how would a reasonable person behaved? Am I right? But it's even, it's even more important in, in contract and in delict because there we're dealing with good faith and that kind of thing because the reasonable man is presumed to always behave in good faith. The reasonable man is pre presumed to be a moral person. But the reason I have to tell you about the reasonable man is because the reasonable man is the standard by which we measure fault. And you cannot be liable unless you're at fault. So in order to determine liability, we have to say, how would a reasonable person in your position have behaved? And if you didn't reach that reasonable standard, then you're liable. I'm giving you a very simplistic overview because I don't have time. But that's what we mean by reasonable man. It's a phrase frequently used in delict, criminal law to denote a hypothetical person in society who exercises average care, skill, and judgment in his or her conduct. The type of conduct that society requires of its members. Why? Because we want a fair society. We want a reasonable society for the protection of their own and others' interests. And it's comparative. It's a comparative standard. In other words, when we've got a set of facts in front of us, the judge is going to look at how did the defendant behave and how would a reasonable man or a reasonable woman have behaved in the same circumstances. Okay. It's supposed to be an objective test. Well, whether it's objective or not, I don't know. There's always going to be some type of subjectivity. Us, as your lecturers, we have to mark your papers. We try to be objective, but we, we're fallible, and so is the judge. Only one that is, not, uh, that is infallible is God. So you can't expect the law to create something perfect and to have a perfect result. You can't denigrate the law for that. You can denigrate the people who don't apply it properly, who apply it rigidly, who are asses. Which brings me to the origin of that. I should have done it earlier, but I want to tell you about this proverbial phrase. I got this off the internet. Uh, the law is an ass. This proverbial expression is of English origin, and the ass being referred to here is the English colloquial name for a donkey. 
not the American S. <laughs> which we will leave behind. <laughs> Donkeys have a somewhat unjustified reputation for obstinance and stupidity that has given us the adjective asinine. It is a stupidity, it is a stupidly rigid application of the law that this phrase calls into question. Not the law, the rigid application of the law. Not the law. So you see, the law is not an S. <laughs> Who applies it? the asses, but not the law. It is easy to find reference works and websites that attribute the phrase to Charles Dickens, who put into print in Oliver Twist, 1838, the origins of this phrase, but it's actually not. But I'll read to you from Charles Dickens. When Mr. Bumble, the unhappy spouse of a domineering wife, is told in court that, and I quote, the law supposes that your wife acts under your direction. Replies, if the law supposes that, said Mr. Bumble, squeezing his hat emphatically in both hands, the law is an ass. <laughs> well, when the law presumes something, it's rebuttable, which means that the person who wants to prove otherwise can deduce evidence to the contrary. So in those days, the 1800s, the law wouldn't have been an ass to presume that a woman would obey her husband, because she probably would have in those days. So that was not incorrect, but we need to look at the reasonable person in the circumstances of, those, of that particular individual. So the law would say, okay, we'll presume that your wife obeys you, but you can come and rebut that presumption by adducing evidence that actually your wife bosses you around. And then that presumption will have been rebutted. But if the law is rigidly applied, then we'll just presume that every wife obeys her husband. Then the law would be an S. Have I made my point? But I just want to tell you that it doesn't come from Oliver Twist. It doesn't come from Charles Dickens. Um, just out of interest, it was published um, in Charles Dickens, but the authors, we're not sure of. Um, they could, they, it was uh, Dickens who brought the phrase into the general public, but they say that um, it was Chapman's play, um, a Parasite or Revenge for Honour, and, and the playwright Harry Glapthorne, who actually wrote it, or possibly somebody else, but we don't need all that detail. So not, not Charles Dickens. I'm sure you've all read this slide. Can I go on to the next one? You see, it's, it, it can't really be an objective test because of all these surrounding influences. So then we're going to ask ourselves, but you know, does this, does this reasonable man exist? And we can't define him and things change all the time. And the reasonable man has got to reflect the ethics and morality of the day. And that changes all the time. Um, I'm sure you will recall, uh, probably in the 50s and the 60s, it, it, it was a criminal offense uh, for homosexuals to, uh, to breathe. <laughs> Homosexuality was a criminal offense. It still is in some countries. Uh, but let me give you an, an example closer to home. In the 60s, in South Africa, it was a criminal offense uh, to have an adulterous affair. Now, if that were so today, we would have three quarters of the population <laughs> behind it. Bars. So we need to, you see how the reasonable man changes over time. Maybe the reasonable woman in 1820 obeyed her husband. Not so anymore. So you see, the reasonable man has to be malleable and the law has to be malleable. That's why it can't be certain. 
It can't be certain. The, the law, for the people who practice law, the only time you have certainty is if you're a traffic cop. Because then you've gone over the speed limit, you've broken the law, and you're guilty. Okay? Intention, no intention, you went over the speed limit, you've broken the law. Okay? The only place where we're going to have malleability is if in mitigation of fine but not on whether you broke the law or not. I think I'm about to conclude, and I want to say that it's precisely the uncertainty in the law that makes the law alive, and that's what makes me passionate about the law.